Smiling faces right after Thanksgiving, and looks like everybody had plenty to eat. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Looks like everyone enjoyed their time with family and friends, so praise the Lord. <clears throat> I want to start today, if you'd open your Bibles with me, we're going to be doing a lot of sword drills today for today's message, so I hope you're prepared. I hope you had a good night of rest, and we'll be taking a look here at a lot of scripture today. So I want you to take your time, find the scripture, and hopefully the way you came in isn't the way that you leave this morning. Amen. <clears throat> so if you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 12, <clears throat> today's message is titled Sufficient Grace. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly will I rather... Glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Let's pray. Good and gracious Father, thank you so much for your sufficient grace. That's what's allowing me to stand today, Lord, to stand on your word, that it would not return unto you void. Lord, we love you so much. I pray for this message today. I pray that those that are hurting, those that are, that are in pain for their loved ones, those that are in health issues themselves, whatever the case may be, Lord. I pray that we would all have this wonderful and awesome, sufficient grace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Now this is a well-known passage here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 6 through 10. This is one of the most important and least understood in Christendom at large. This is important for us as Grace Bible Ambassadors to study this out together so we can learn a little bit more about God's sufficient grace. <clears throat> the theme of this story is the glory of God's grace is found in Christ, not ourselves, Amen. or our circumstances. Today we're going to be discussing five items in detail. We're going to talk about the foolishness of glorying. We're going to discuss the thorn in the flesh of our Apostle Paul. We're going to be discussing Paul's pattern for prayer. We're going to be discussing this grace that is sufficient. And last but not least, we will be discussing today the pleasure in our infirmities. Read this passage one more time before we begin. For though I would desire to glory, I should not, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth me of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. 
And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We can all have foolishness and glorying in and of ourself. When we do something for someone and we decide to boast about it, sometimes it's just seen by others. As you'll see when we break down some of the scriptures today, sometimes it's just the act of doing something generous that takes us to that place where it may even appear that we are, we are boasting. And there is foolishness in this kind of glory. Lest any man think of me above. There is danger to glory. And turn, turn with me to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Now, this is some of the very beginning of the Apostle Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. And as you all know, since the day of salvation, much like Paul's journey, this journey of understanding God's sufficient grace is just that. It's a journey. It's one step in front of the other, learning this thing that we call grace. So as Paul, verse 8 says, And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and he walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in likeness of men. And that's a lowercase g, gods. And they called Barnabas, Jupiter, and Paul, Mercurius, because he was the thief speaker, chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. Which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all the things are therein. Who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their ways. Nevertheless, he left them, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with good, with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained, they the people that had not done sacrifice unto them. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. You see, the acts of Paul in his healing ministry at this point in time in his journey that stirred these Jews up. They came out at him violently, stoning him. There is danger to glory. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. As you know here at Grace Bible Ambassadors, we are the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, 
we're reminded we are not the head. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And yes, that says every man. Be gentle, brothers and sisters in Christ, with those that we're trying to minister to. We are not the head. Turn with me to the book of Galatians. Go to the right, if you will, please. To Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Verse 3 says, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Church, we're nothing without Christ. Amen? Amen. Absolutely nothing. Without Christ, we don't have breath in our lungs. Without Christ, we don't have a beat in our heart. And without Christ, we don't have this Word of God today in our hands. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. A little to the right. It's important to know, guys, that we cannot glory in ourselves and have the mind of Christ. Chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 say, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. There is no glorying in ourself. And you can't do that if you have the mind of Christ. You see, this glory that I'm talking about in our achievements would be contrary to the message of grace, to the message of the mystery, and especially to the message of the body of Christ today. Brothers and sisters, as we read up there, about the thorn in the flesh. Let's deal with this thorn in the flesh. A lot of people have studied and tried to come up with what that thorn in the flesh that Paul had. But it's not said. They want to question the Bible, but Paul doesn't give us a direct response in regards to what that thorn in the flesh was. And for a reason, we'll talk about that here shortly. But let's discuss some of the things that it could be. Possibly in infirmity in the flesh. Maybe it was the instances that Paul experienced in his circumstances that were his thorn in the flesh. Maybe it was the people that surrounded Paul. Maybe it was even the people that he did ministry with. So let's take a look and unpack a few things here this morning on what that thorn in the flesh could be. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Ye, verses 13 through 15, Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Some suppose that it was Paul's eyesight. Some suppose because he wrote in large letters throughout the Bible that Paul had a problem with his vision. There are other passages, and we'll probably cover most of them here, that he might have had a deformity with his eyes. 
Maybe he, had a, maybe he had a lazy eye like myself. Maybe he had something that just was not attractive to those that were listening. Now, did this mean that in this verse here, did that mean that they were going to pluck out their eyes and give them to, the, to him? Maybe they were that excited, you know. They were that excited about the gospel of the grace of God message that was being revealed to their eyes that it was actually worth that. Maybe they were just, take my eyes. If this will help you on the journey to spread this gospel of the grace of God message, take my eyes, Paul. Take my eyes. Maybe. Maybe not. Speculation. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. A little to the left, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscoring of all things unto this day. Maybe it was Paul's appearance. That of a, that of a homeless man. Maybe it was the appearance of Paul's clothing that he wore. Maybe it smelled. He was on the road a lot. He was traveling a lot. He was not guaranteed, much like some of the missionaries that we support that go on these journeys to spread the gospel message. Most nights they don't know where they are going to lay their head at night, but they are trusting in the Lord. Paul could have been that very same way, couldn't he? It says right there, <laughs> he was hungry, he thirsted. At times they were naked. You know, it wasn't just enough that those Jews took them out and stoned them. They would strip them of their clothing and do this to publicly embarrass them. Imagine that, going to the next city, smelling and dirty, without clothing, and trusting the Lord for that provision back then. Pretty amazing. Could that have been his thorn in the flesh? Could be. Take a look with me at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. A little to the right. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Six, verse 4. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. I'm going to continue. Verse 5 as well. In stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. You see, Paul dealt with imprisonment. He dealt with beatings. This would not be attractive when you're preaching the new message, the gospel of the grace of God message that saves today. People are looking at him. If this message is so great, why are you getting beat up? Why are you getting stoned? Because people did not want to get out of their religious comfort zones. That's why. It was an offense to say, Jesus Christ paid it all. His shed blood on the cross, His death, His burial, His resurrection was enough. It was so distasteful in their mind and in their hearts that they devised evil plans and things to do 
to torment, torment anyone that brought that message across their path. Same book, 2 Corinthians. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 10. For his letters say they are, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech contemptible. Where do we hear that word contemptible? We hear that word in court, right? Contemptible. So his presence was weak. He probably, like myself, going and having three full meals a day, he probably looked lean. He was getting enough steps in, if you will, church. And I don't mean that to be funny, but that was the way they traveled, by sandal. And if you were lucky, which right now, as you can see, the Apostle Paul, his luck was not looking pretty awesome. But if he was fortunate enough to have an animal back then to cart him around to all the places that he went, he probably would not be looking so weak to those. In the message, Paul calls it the messenger of Satan. That was, that was in verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, these revelations that were given through, to Paul through his revelations and experiences, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. We've seen in Scripture a couple times where it was talking about buffeting. <sighs> Turn with me a chapter over to chapter 11. Chapter 11 in 2 Corinthians For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works." Maybe that thorn in the flesh, maybe that was the people around them, again, trying to damage the new message that was given from God to Paul to deliver to the Gentiles. Those workers of iniquity, those workers that have turned themselves in to Satan to do the work that he would be doing. Turn with me to 1 Timothy. To the right. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 20 says, actually we'll, we'll back it up. Verse 19 says, Holding faith and a, and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Paul was dealing with people in his own ministry. You all know the stories of Hymenaeus and Alexander. Wait a minute. Paul delivered, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Paul's message was serious. If you were getting in front of that message, Paul was going to ask God to intervene on his behalf to move you on out. Maybe it was the people that he surrounded himself with. A little to the right, 2 Timothy, a couple pages over, depending on the size of your Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Man, oh man. You know, back then you'd think the coppersmith would be pretty, pretty busy, but 
Was this somebody that could have affected the ministry that Paul was sharing to the Gentiles? Maybe it was the coppersmith. 2 Thessalonians. Go with me to 2 Thessalonians. We're going to go back to our left just a little bit there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. You know, throughout Scripture, they talk about witchcraft and different things. Were there people coming alongside Paul, trying to perform miracles, trying to act as though they were speaking on behalf of God? Could have been one of his thorns in his flesh, right? A little to the left, we're going to jump back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. Wherefore, we, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Maybe it was just good old Satan again. Affecting Paul. Maybe it wasn't the folks he was doing ministry with. Maybe it wasn't his physical appearance to his flesh. Maybe it wasn't the circumstances he was going through. Maybe it was just Satan. To the left, 1 Corinthians. And if I get my left and rights backed up, I apologize, but I'm pretty good at that, I think. Lord, humble me. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9 says, For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Oh, we know the biggest adversary is Satan, so again, could be Satan. And last but not least, turn over with me to Revelation chapter 2. Now we know this book was written by John of the churches of Asia. Revelation chapter 2 verse 9 says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. A lot of that going along in the, uh, going in the world today. Synagogues of Satan out there. Now this thorn in the flesh. You have to question yourself, right? When you read that passage and you think about it. So this was given to, ba to Paul in a sense. But does that mean it's given to to me, you and me. And I can stand here and say no today to that because the course of the world opposes God's will. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. There we go. You guys beat me to it. Praise the Lord. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. 
For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Amen. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Amen. Hallelujah. What purpose was this thorn in the flesh to Paul? You know, it was an expedient one. Lest he should be exalted above measure. That's in there twice. Take a look at that again in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Two times. The Lord is working on Paul as quickly as as possible for a reason. God purposed that he be brought low. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, please. A little to the right. Chapter 15. A couple more pages. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. A little to the right, Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You see, God purposed to bring Paul to a low place so that he could minister grace effectively to the Gentiles. Amen? Another reason we're discussing this passage in the Word of God for the sufficient grace has to do with our prayer life. You see, I don't know if you recall, I besought the Lord thrice. Who else besought Almighty God, Almighty God three times? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. You know, it's very humbling because we all have so many, so many prayers that are deep and well-rooted in our hearts that we want for our families, our loved ones, our friends, our acquaintances, and especially our enemies. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, please. I probably did. That's okay, church. Little grace, little grace. Matthew chapter 26, we're going to go to verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth, findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What could ye not watch with me, one hour? Come on, Peter. 
Verse 41, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were very heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Three times. Three times for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to our Heavenly Father. Three times from the Apostle Paul to relieve that thorn in the flesh, that it might depart from him. You see, he prays for deliverance and healing and help and is denied. Much like those that claim healing ministries out there today. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but in accordance from our Apostle Paul in the pattern that we've been given, that prayer works a little differently. You see, uh, turn with me, if you will, uh, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Before I get ahead of myself and get preaching. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4. Verse 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Amen, church? Amen. Now, wonderful. Make all your requests no made known unto God. Amen? Amen? Now, turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 28. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Amen, church? Amen. So we make our requests known unto God, and God answers out of His will. Praise the Lord. Paul's learning something about grace and prayer here, which we could all take a little humbling. You know, <clears throat> talking about circumstances, when things are going great, oh, hallelujah. Man, we feel like the best Pentecostal. We're doing the dance. We're doing, we're doing it all. And we're thinking we're blessed by God. But the minute the minute we lose a child, you think, oh, what did I do? Why am I being cursed? Maybe you haven't lost a child. But that feeling that a parent could have in their mind and in their heart, Lord, what did I do to deserve this? You know, we're real quick to wave our fist to our Heavenly Father when things don't go our way, when prayers don't get answered in the, in the way that we think they should. But we've gotten used to, and, and all of us sitting here today and online probably have been in a church or been in a place where if you have faith, as big as a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. And 
And that was true back then for Christ's earthly ministry. They could do some pretty awesome things as they were ushering in the kingdom of God. They could heal the lame. They could make the blind see. They could take away those fleshly infirmities that we talked about earlier that Paul is experiencing pretty much throughout his entire ministry. But if you stick around here at Grace Bible Ambassadors long enough, you'll understand as the kingdom of God And then you had the gospel, excuse me, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And you had the gospel of the grace of God. Now, okay, this was of your 12 apostles. This is our one apostle, the apostle Paul. As the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God decreased with the twelve, the gospel of the grace of God began to increase with Paul and the Gentiles. Now this is a horrible drawing, and I hate to even put that online for our viewers. I'm not an artist. But the gospel of the grace of God, as it continued to increase, you will see that the powers and the supernatural healings that the Apostle Paul did, those decreased. The kingdom of God, as that message faded out, and Israel stayed on their plan, and the Jews stayed on their plan, those miracles ceased. It's very important to understand that, folks. You might run across a person one day who loves the message of prayer from the New Testament. A brother in Christ, a sister in Christ. Brothers and sisters, for those weaker in the faith, those that have not understand, understood that our grace is so much better, so much better than the miracles, so much better than the healing, so much better than anything you could ever imagine. You know, in heaven, angels are jealous of what we know sitting here today. Next, we're going to talk about grace is sufficient. The title of today's message, grace is sufficient. Sufficient grace, excuse me. This is at the heart of the gospel of the grace of God. Throughout Romans through Philemon, we learn not only what the gospel of the grace of God is, but how to stand in grace how to walk in grace, and how to effectively communicate the gospel of grace of God message today. For those that might be under religious bondage, for those that might be running out to all the nations and giving the wrong commission for today. You have a great commission in the Old Testament. In the, in the New Testament, we have the grace commission. It would do you well to understand the difference. One day we are going to be accountable for what is said from this pulpit. Right. My grace is sufficient. God said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Amen. Grace is not weak. 
It works. It's the power of Christ. Turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 says, What shall we say then, that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. Turn to the right to Ephesians. Book of Ephesians, chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Amen. The power of Christ, the glory of God, is in His grace. When you are at the weakest, is when Christ is your strength. Amen. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Told you we'd be doing some sword drills today, but it's worth it. God's word will not return unto him void. 2 Timothy chapter 1. For God hath not, verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Chapter 2. Verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Pure grace, God, God's riches at Christ's expense, is His might. It's His strength. It's His work. And it's that power that is given to those that are weak. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. You know, we talk about the full armor of God, and I suggest everyone put that, put that armor on in the morning. But I think something that's overlooked very often is the simple verse that starts this passage. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen? His might. Turn back to Galatians. Back to your left. Chapter 3. Verse 22. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Amen. You must believe to understand God's sufficient grace. Verse 
the pleasure in infirmities. You see, the glory of God is not found in His righteous rule. It's not found in the holiest of holy people or miracles today. It's found in His grace. Every evil deed... Every weakness, every failure, every struggle, every infirmity, and every sinner demands God's grace. This power of Christ and the glory of God, it's in His grace. If we rejoice in Him, our infirmity works out hope. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. All right, Romans chapter 5. And patient, verse 4, and patience, experience, and experience hope. Turn over to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 verse 20 says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always so now, also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be li by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to conclude with this today. Chapter 7, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. The pleasure and joy in that you witness what Christ has given you, His sufficient grace. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together today. Thank you for the fellowship that we've had. Thank you for the prayers that have been brought to the table, both spoken and unspoken today. Lord, you know our utterings. You know what's at the depths of our heart that we don't even want to say today where we need help, Lord. But please help us. Lord, you said to bring those supplications and prayer to you and to trust that your will would be done. And we do, Lord. We thank you for that. We praise you for that. And we thank you, Lord God Almighty, for your sufficient grace. Thank you for using our Apostle Paul for us and a pattern for us today as the body of Christ. We thank you so much. We love you so much. And we pray for a great week. Please watch over us all. In Jesus' name, amen.